Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Mob Podcast. Another episode. I'm here today with my bro, Miles, Mr. Smooth Operator, Left Hand Davenport, the bearded one, 2J in the building here today. I am here. We're going to talk about a lot of the NFL stuff that we didn't get to um, because we had a jam-packed show full of all the NBA free agency and the trades and everything that happened. So we're going to touch on all the NFL stuff. Before we get into it, shout out again to all of our loyal listeners, our subscribers, our followers. We appreciate y'all. Keep doing what y'all doing. Uh, We got some content, some merch coming out for y'all soon. But we have to start here, I think. It is Tuesday, going on Wednesday. Ah, wow. My days is really mixed up. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Today is Wednesday. We got to talk about that Bucks rams game. Rams beat Rams beat the Bucks 27-24. A lot of people did not per se see it being this close and did not see Tom Brady playing the way that Tom Brady played. What were some of y'all takeaways from uh this Rams Bucks game? Um well, I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, after after the game, I wasn't really surprised at how it went. You know, Tom Brady he's, his his age is catching up to is catching up to him. You know, um, his he was relying on too much. Like all you gotta do is get pressure on Tom Brady, and he's he's pretty much an average quarterback. You know, as as crazy as that might sound, but you know, I wasn't really surprised. The, the Rams' defense is is it's tough. So, you know, um, I would be honest with you. I I thought it wasn't as close as a score showed. Um, but like I said, I, I wasn't really surprised. And you know, the Rams was the better team overall. And you know, I think Tom Brady's kind of trying to force feed. He's trying to force feed Antonio Brown too much because that's his new toy. Um, but I'll be honest with you. Like I said, I think the the Bucks is extremely overrated, um, and so I wasn't really surprised. Yeah, it's crazy how like Tom Brady just doesn't play well against these good teams on this team, especially coming into the season. They were looked at as like a Super Bowl contender, and. I mean, they're not really beating the teams that they're going to have to face down the, down the line. So, I mean, he has all the weapons. He's got A.B., Godwin, Mike Evans. That, that one touchdown was crazy. But I don't know. He's just not getting it done. And like you said, it could be the age. It could be, you know, A.B.'s been staying at his house too long in his head. Tell, throw, throw me the passes. Throw me the ball. But he's just not getting it done in the big – big games I mean they're seven and four so it's not like they're they're doing that bad but this wasn't a, a good a good game for them like Jared Goff outplayed Brady like I, I don't think I'd ever say those words in a sentence especially yeah. after that Super Bowl but he did I mean those receivers looked elite like Cooper Cup he's filthy like like Devontae said he's the most underrated receiver in the league like route running crazy and Robert Woods was eaten, so it was tough. It was a the the scoreboard definitely is deceiving. Like it, it looks closer than it was. So exactly. What do y'all think about the possibility of them not running the ball enough? Like it seems like they're giving Tom Brady too many attempts to throw. And when you have the running backs that they have, especially last week, how they played a ninety-eight yard run and over hundred plus yards running. Do you think maybe they should get more attempts to the running back? Because if I remember correctly, Ronald Jones only had 11 attempts. Yeah, I mean, um, their running game is not that good. So, so watching it, they have – I mean, you have to run the ball more even though your running game is not that great because you just got to keep the defense honest. But people know that they're not that good. Their offensive line is not that great. So, they're, they're in the position, you know, Fournette, I'm not sure what happened to him, but he just kind of fell off completely. And Ronald Jones, he's okay, but ain't no one scared of him. So I just think that the way they're built, they, they have to pass the ball. And they got too many weapons on the, uh, on the outside to, to really run the ball 30 times. You know, I think if they ran the ball maybe 18 to 20 times, it would, it would help them. But, you know, like I said, because they're not doing that well, no one's afraid of it. So they just kind of put themselves in the positions of where they're at right now. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, like, Nobody ran it in this game. Like, Goff threw it 50 times. Brady threw it 48 times. So, it's like it was a – it was slinging the rock in this game. Brady not doing as well as Goff did, but the running game wasn't really used this week. 
I mean, it was, it was one of those games that whoever ended up with the ball last would win. That's kind of how it ended up happening. I mean, like you said, Ronald Jones, he, he rushed for almost like 200 yards last week. Then comes in, doesn't even get over 25 yards rushing. So clearly well, yeah. they went in a different direction. Yeah. I mean, I would, it's easier to set than done to run against Aaron Donald. But, mm-hmm. but the, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, like you said, he threw, he threw it a lot. Both, both plays threw it a lot. And then to your point, like, you know, normally, yeah, the last team that had the ball was going to win that game until Tom Brady overthrew another target. So <laughs> everybody's overlooking that. I think that, you know, if it was anybody else, they would get destroyed. But somehow he gets the benefit of doubt when all year – it's, it's becoming a theme now. And, and, and the excuse is that he didn't have OTAs and training camp, but nobody had that. I understand he has a whole different team. But what we are 11 games into the year now, I, I don't want to hear that. That's that's just excuses. You know, he, he got to figure that out. Yeah. Speaking of, the benefit of, speaking of the benefit of the doubt, now they're one and three in prime time this year, uh, the big games. They're one and three. And something that went crazy and blew up on Twitter was yet another game where Tom Brady does not shake the hand of the opposing quarterback when he loses. When he wins, hey, what's up? How you doing? How's the kids? When he loses, my man goes straight to the locker room. See, I want to ask y'all. When he loses, they follow the COVID rules. They're like, you know, I'll see you later. They, they wave goodbye. But when he was, he's winning, he wants to rub it in your face, shake your hand, look you in your eyes. But yeah, it's funny that way. I, I, I lost all respect for him, man. <laughs> He's terrible. I wanted to ask y'all, is sportman is sportsmanship a big deal or is it kind of like a myth, something that, you know, we just teach the kids at a younger age and, you know, once we get become adults, it's kind of just a myth. It's not non-existent. I feel like at the QB position, it's kind of like expected. Like you're supposed to go to the other quarterback and shake his hand and like, you guys are both basically the leaders of the team. So this is what the leader's supposed to do. But, you know, Brady, he gets away with it. He's got, he's got a few rings on his hands. So he, he can, he can walk off the field and not shake people's hands and not catch too much flack for it. Look, see, I think, no, first of all, as a quarterback, especially, you know, that's, they always show the quarterbacks and the coaches that that are the main people they show at, at, at the end of the game, shaking hands. And it just bothers me. Look, LeBron's done it a couple of times. I don't really care for it when he does it. But it's a little different when it's known, you know, because the difference with basketball, you know, they do it each every player. But, like, Tom Brady, it's so obvious. And I think he said something about he doesn't have relationships with Nick Foles because he didn't, he didn't do it with Nick Foles and he didn't do it with um, Goff. But when he beat Goff in the Super Bowl, he did do it. So, yeah, he, he, he you know, I was watching – a talk show and they were talking about how he's like he's a he's a big sore loser but that's that's such an easy cop out i think because that's just it's just wrong you know play kids is watching after looking after you you know watching the games and they look up to you so i just think that the message that you're sending is basically it's okay to to act like a you know a cry baby when you lose you know um and then when you win you know it, that's okay so that's that's when it's okay that, that's just a, a wrong message that he's sending yeah i think it's uh he gets away with, like you said, because it's the rings. Like, I think we see this also, and this probably be a whole other episode. But when you see Tom Brady, when you see Peyton Manny, they get mad. They start yelling on the sideline. It's okay. They're they're champions. They're just trying to galvanize the troops. But when you see a, a Chad Johnson, a Terrell Owens do it, are they OBJ? OBJ? Are they not just being passionate? Do they not just want to win? Also, why is the narrative different when it comes? Specifically, I'm Tom Brady. Tom Brady could yell and scream and spit in somebody's face and be throwing his helmet, and it's like, oh, look at that. He's passionate. He's, he's bringing the troops together. OBJ, let's get him out of New York. Well, I don't want to say it's – I don't – yeah. Go ahead. No, my bad. My bad. You go ahead. No, I was going to say, I don't want to say it's a race thing because it, 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 it could be something – because, you know, if, if Cam Newton would have did what, what happened yesterday – all day they would have been talking about it and, 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 you know, destroying him. So I think it has something to do with race, honestly, and also, yeah, the rank thing. But, again, does that, does, that's a, still a wrong message you send me just because you, you have, you know, 10 rings. It doesn't give you the right that when you lose, 
you don't know how to handle yourself, you know? So like uh, someone said, nobody likes to lose. So it's not that when you lose and then they go shake the person's hand that they're like, oh, I'm okay with losing. No, that's just, the, that's it. You competed, you shake hands, you move on, you know? And especially if you're shaking hands with a guy before, that's just, you know, that, I don't know, that just it rubs me the wrong way. And you could look at it like that, but I also look at it like, you know, you see Tom Brady, he's won pretty much his whole career. And then you look at OBJ, he's been on teams that he's doing this and they're not necessarily winning games. Like he's made the playoffs, what, once in his career? So that's where it looks like you're demonstrative, you're doing too much. Like Tom Brady, when he's doing it, it tends to work out where they, they end up winning or it, it actually helps the team. Like OBJ, it, it, it becomes a distraction because he's doing it to like hype up the team. But if they're losing, then it looks like, oh, this guy's all about himself. That's how I see it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's faulting him, though, because he's on a bad team. Like if OBJ did it on the Patriots or, you know, the Saints or any of these good teams, I don't think – that they would look at it that way. Like, it just looks that way because they're losing. But it's not his fault. You know, he's a receiver. So, he, he – as a quarterback, you have more control of winning winning or losing. You know, the receiver, you know, obviously, he can only do so much. So, I think that it's it's easy to say for Brady that, oh, well, you know, he, you know he's won. So, when he does it, he's doing it for the right reasons. It's, it's not fair for OBJ because he's doing it because he's frustrated – and, you know, whether he's not getting the ball or not or whatever the case may be. So I just think that it's easy to find excuses for Brady to justify his actions, um, you know. Because, like I said, whether he's winning or not, he's showing up his teammates. So, you know, it, you know so I, I think it's the same thing, but they just happen to end up winning because he's on a better team. Yeah, I think that I was about to say that too. It's kind of tough for players like OBJ, players like T.O. We're mentioning wide receivers. It's only so much the wide receiver, the running back, the defensive back, it's only so much they can do. That's why when you hear quarterbacks, you be like, all right, they had a, a record of 50 and 24. You don't say that about any other position. You feel me? So it's like, you don't ever be like, oh, Rondé Barber had a record. Nah, you're talking about the actual quarterback, what their record was. Um, and that's kind of what comes with being that quarterback. Like, you're the, you're the leader of the team. You're the face of the franchise more times than not. And whether they win or lose, it's going on your record. I could be Jerry Rice, he won rings, but I could be Jerry Rice and we could go two and 14. But if I had 120 catches, you're not asking what my record is. You're looking at the stat line, you feel me? One of the other games that was huge in regards of people didn't know how it was going to uh, turn out. It was a lot of mixed reviews. Taysom Hill ends mm. up starting for the Saints. He does serviceable. He wasn't, you know, we're not going to say that. This was a Hall of Fame type of night and he should have been starting his whole career. But they come out, win the game, 24-9. to nine. What were your takeaways from this game and Taysom Hill starting over Jameis? Like, is this an indictment on Jameis that, hey, this might be the end of his, his chance to be a starter in the league? I just think he's more – like, Taysom Hill's more familiar with the offense. Like, he's been there for how long? Like, four years now, five mm -hmm. years? So, he's like – he's been a gadget player, but he's also been taking those QB reps behind Drew Brees. So – I think, yeah, they made the right choice with Taysom Hill. I don't know many people who are going to choose Jameis to come in and, you know, take over for Drew Brees and have that much confidence in him. Like, I I didn't know what Taysom Hill was going to do, but when you look at the stat line, it wasn't that bad. Like, they used him kind of similar to how I thought they'd use him. Like, had him running a lot. He had two rushing touchdowns. He didn't really take that many chances downfield because that's not the type of QB he is. He was – he was giving, giving the ball a lot to Michael Thomas. So they, he did enough to win the game. That's, that's all they need him to do at this point. Because right now they're hoping Drew Brees comes back at some point this year. I mean, he's got like 11 broken ribs. That's, that's going to be tough. But, I mean, Taysom Hill didn't look that bad. It was the Falcons, though. But we'll see how he does this next week. So I will say, I'll start by saying I am a diehard Saints fan. So mm – -hmm. So I might be a little biased here, but, but um, I'll be honest with you. I, I love Taysom Hill. I mean, I love everything he brings to the table. So I wasn't really surprised at all that they, they used him um, to get the first crack at the starting job. Because like you said, he's been on the system for four years. You gave him $21 million guarantee. Um, you know, you have to see what he, what he can do. Um, Jameis, I think – so, look, you got to see what he can do. 
obviously they were playing the average team, so it gives them a chance to get more comfortable. And like I said, they didn't do anything crazy. I think he went like 18 or 23, like 240 yards passing. He didn't have any touchdowns throwing. Well, I think one got called back on holding the penalty, but I think he did more than – like, I think he did beautifully, honestly. Like, he, like, he didn't have to do a, a great game because the defense was locked down. So, I think what they were going to – I think the game plan was, okay, if he struggled this week and next week, then they have the opportunity to bring in Jameis for two weeks um, just to see what, what he has because you want to see what you have in the future. You pretty much know what Jameis is. You didn't know what Taysom is. So, Jameis, he's, look, he, got, he has a turnover problem. Um, it doesn't matter how many weapons he has, he has that issue. Yeah, I'm sure Sean Payne, Sean Payne fixed it somewhat. But, no, you had to – you definitely had to uh, see what Taysom Hill brought to the table first. Um, and like I said, Sean Payne loves him. And to be honest with you, I got more faith in Sean Payne's decision-making than anything else. He knows what he's doing. So, I'm not surprised at all that, 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 that that's his new toy, you know. So, that, I'm not surprised that he went with him. Yeah, I mean, Sean Payton said it was last year. He said that the quarterback of the future was Taysom Hill, and people thought, you know, he was joking around and trying to, you know, save face or, like, put up a smoke screen. But Sean Payton was actually serious. Uh, as you guys all have mentioned, he's been in the offense for four years, and reports came out this whole year. Jameis hasn't even taken any snaps with the first or the second team. He's been a third-string quarterback. So – being that you haven't had any actual true practice in the offense and reps, I can get why you would start Taysom Hill. He's that's like you going to you know practice for four years with the Lakers and somebody gets injured. Are they going to start you? Or are they going to start the person who is known for just game? Yeah. So I get it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like I said, just to 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 end end that real quick. I think like like I said, they. First, you got to understand he's a dual threat quarterback. So, and people need to stop acting like he didn't start four years in college at quarterback. I know college can be a little different, and he hasn't really played that position in a, in a while. But he's thrown the ball before. He 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 can throw the ball. Yeah, he's not not many people as accurate as Drew Brees. Jameis is not either. So, so I think you got to you got to take advantage of your weapons as much as you can. You know what Winston is. If, if that's the future, that's the future. But you got to see why you kept chasing him around. Besides all these. You know, he's Sean Payne said he was here to be a quarterback. All these other stuff he's been doing because we have Drew Brees. So, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, I think just to throw it in there, I think Tim Tebow should have taken a page out of Taysom Hill's book. Taysom Hill has just done whatever the team needed. He's made yeah. the in the league for him just being a good player and being a professional. They gave him that bag, and now he has the opportunity. You know. With these 11 broken ribs and my man had a collapsed lung and he's having a hard time breathing, I think this might be <laughs> the best time for Drew Brees to just ease on out. That's a serious type of injury right there. We're talking about it's messing with your breathing and 11 broken ribs. I wouldn't play I think him. he'll be back. I don't think he's done, though. I think he'll be back by the end of the by, – probably by that Chiefs game. In four, oh, no. Four I weeks. think he'll be back this year, but I think this will probably be his last go-around. Oh, he's done. Yeah, yeah, he's done. Yeah, be it. Yeah, because that's something – an injury like that, that ain't nothing to play with, especially as you get older. I'm good. I need all my ribs. I need – Yeah, them. yeah. And his, his wife and kids is probably like, all right, that's yeah. it. Hey, Pops, <laughs> bring, bring it home, yeah. Um, exactly. We have to talk about it uh, – the conversation of quarterbacks has kind of been the theme so far of this show. The Ravens loss. Lamar Jackson performance was not stellar. Um, we've had conversations before over and over on the show talking about how it seems like the league has caught up to Lamar Jackson. What were your takeaways from this game? And are we looking at the Ravens now possibly not either getting into the playoffs or, or do we even see them as a, a serious contender? If Lamar Jackson is playing this way, I don't know. We might have to rethink the Ravens even being a threat this year in the playoffs. It's too predictable. Like, you know that it's like a run-pass option, and when they pass it, it's right in front of the line of scrimmage. Like, they don't take any shots downfield. Literally take – they don't even use Hollywood Brown. Like, he, he's had games with no catches, no targets, and then he's like the fastest guy on the field. Like, they're using Willie Sneed like he's Michael Thomas out here. I, I, and I don't understand it. Like, Lamar, he looked good last year. It could have been, you know, 
the offense was new to the whole league and nobody knew what to do with it. But this year, he doesn't look that good as a quarterback. So he's taking a huge step back, like a couple steps back this year. Because when they're down, I've, I've always said this, like when they get down, they have no chance because this is not an offense that can get into shootouts with teams. They're not a, the type of team to come down and score quickly. They're not like the Chiefs and Mahomes. They're the type to like grind it out, run it like 40 times. Lamar throws it, what, 25 times in the game. And you just hope the defense plays extremely well. Like, I don't know with this team at this point. They've lost, what, this is three in a row? Yes, yeah, I think they're six and four now. Yeah, six they're six and four. four. And there's no chance they're not going to win the division. That's a wrap. Now they got to fight for a wild card. And even that's up in the air with all the teams playing well right now. And they're, they're in a down, downward spiral. So I, I don't know how you fix it at this point. Like Lamar, he's not – he hasn't shown that he's capable of being that type of quarterback. So I think – so I think – well, honestly, um, no one's afraid of Lamar's arm at all. Uh, you know, his legs obviously from college days and especially last year is what makes him – what made him MVP. But the league definitely caught up to that. No one – no one's uh, – has t- – no, that they're going to – they're just – Telling him, beat us with your arm. We're not. You're not gonna be running around like you're a running back or a receiver. So, I think that those 14 and two days are definitely over. Um, the defense is not is, is average right now. I don't know what they're doing at running back. Like I said, they don't really use their best weapon. You know, like you said, Hollywood Brown is the fastest player on the field most most games, and Lamar has an arm. So I don't understand why they don't just chuck it, um, and then see what happens, or just try to figure out how to use Hollywood Brown in different packages. But, no, yeah, Lamar, look, the Ravens might still make the, make the playoffs because of that extra playoff spot they added this year. That's the only way that they were going to make it, honestly, because of that. But there's a lot of good teams. There's a lot of teams that are in that 6-4 and four range. So they got their work cut out for them. Um, but if they do kind of sneak into the playoffs, it's just going to be the same thing that happened in Tennessee last year. I mean, in Baltimore last year when Tennessee beat them. Um, until he gets to – I'm not saying it can never happen, but – He's got to get more accurate. Um, we, so we understand he's elusive, but his accuracy is the only way he's going to get that. First of all, the only way he's going to get the bag that Mahomes got, maybe not nowhere near that, but just in general, he's got to become more accurate. Otherwise, they're not going nowhere. Do you think this puts a damper on teams drafting these quarterbacks now that are dual threats that aren't as accurate? When you look at Lamar, you look at uh, Kyler Murray, um, do you think they, you know, maybe they take a different approach? Like, we want the dual threat quarterback, but they got to be more the air on the side of having, like, a, a Mahomes, who we saw last week. It was a couple times where he could have ran it, and on that last play, he decided to use his feet to get time to throw it to Kelsey. Now, if we saw that with Lamar Jackson, we probably would have saw him actually try to run that. Or throw a pick. I mean, look – I told somebody the other day, I think Kyle Murray is better than Lamar Jackson. So yeah. if, if you're taking a dual threat like that, because obviously Mo, there's two different versions of dual threat. So I think like Mahomes, well, that's, that's just a special breed. But putting him to the side, I think between Lamar and Kyler, the big, the biggest difference is Kyler's accurate. He's actually really accurate. And he's as elusive, maybe maybe a little bit quicker than Lamar, you know, because he has like that quick feet kind of thing. So if you're going to get a dual threat quarterback, Kyler is the kind of – dual threat you need not not Lamar because because I said Kyle people are afraid of him when he passes the ball they're afraid of him more than he runs but they don't let him pass you know Lamar they'll let him they'll let him rock for 30 attempts and and they'll live they'll live with those results but not Kyler anything you got your take on that Miles I mean y'all in the market he's a Jets fan by the way Uh, I'm sorry about that I'm sorry about that. And don't ruin uh, Trevor Lawrence's career. Draft somebody else. <laughs> That's going to be the guy, honestly. But, I mean, like you're saying, like, Mahomes is a different breed, and Kyler has shown that, like, his skill set, that's going to last him a while. Like, he's not Lamar. It's not something you can really game plan because he can actually throw the ball. Like, Lamar, I, like, I watched that game on Sunday, and I was so frustrated. One, because I have him in fantasy, and two – because he just he just doesn't make any of the throws that you need to make as a starting quarterback in this league. Like, that's the difference between him and Kyler. Like, Kyler, I mean, that was luck, that throw to D-Hop, 
the week before, but sometimes you need that. But even before that, he's been playing extremely well and probably having a better season than Lamar had last year because he's he's almost leading the league in rushing touchdowns this year, which is insane. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah, definitely I would take Kyler Murray over Lamar at this point. I don't think it's close. And I hope for the best for Lamar, but I don't I don't believe in his skill set lasting that long anymore because this is not high school football where you put the best athlete at quarterback and just let him do whatever he wants to do. Like this is the NFL and everybody can run just as fast. So Yeah, um we'll see what goes further on with the career of Lamar Jackson. I think Another thing that you're looking to, like we mentioned, the Ravens might have to change up their approach, their game plan. Um, maybe we can say that they're not putting him in the best position to win now because they're still kind of trying to play that offense from last year, and the league's caught up. So now I then look at the head coach and the offensive coordinator like, all right, what are y'all doing to change up the game plan because it's not working? So, A, figure out how to use Hollywood Brown. Bring somebody maybe that's another talent as a wide receiver. I think it's a dual thing where you got to look at the play calling and you got to then look at Lamar. Like, hey, we know what we have as our quarterback. He's not as accurate. What can we do to put him in the best position to succeed? Somebody that was put into the best position to succeed also last week was America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. Stop. I told you, I'm not a fan of nobody this year. I, I don't like nobody this year. You Dallas Cowboys. The season's not even halfway over. It's, it's a little halfway over, but you already quit on your team. I don't get it. You're still in the that's hunt. That's terrible. Yeah, that's, that's terrible. terrible. Hey, Jay, I quit on them week two. So it wasn't week two. I quit. I, 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 get, well, I get it, but that's, that's terrible. I mean, he, he's rocking with the 0-10 team, I mean, so I don't know. <laughs> well, hey, I'm, hopefully this is the last time we don't win a game. After I don't want to go through that abuse. That's a lot of personal abuse to watch these games week by week. Danucci and Gilbert, I, I couldn't go through that type of mental health. I, I, yeah, you feel true, me? but I'd rather, go th- I'd rather go through those, those, those terrible years as opposed to getting robbed in the playoffs like the Saints have been getting in the last. So I think that I rather bad law I rather just be out of the playoffs week three as opposed to just getting robbed. So I don't know. I get that. I'm a Lakers fan, so I'm good on that aspect. But the Cowboys was able to pull out the win. Um ain't much really we talk about with that game. It was the Vikings came in on a winning streak. They should have actually won this game. They somehow let the Cowboys win this game on a last second throw. Um, if you have any takeaway from that game, we could talk about it, but it was not that great of a game. But I want to talk about how, average. how terrible the NFC least is. Now, we're looking at the NFC least. We got the Eagles at 3-6-1, and one, the Giants 3-7, and seven, Washington and the Cowboys are at 3-7. and seven. Who are y'all picking to actually come out of the NFC East? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. It's kind of fun. That nobody's allowed to be in the playoffs. Yeah. It's fun, though. I think – I think who, bad And they're, like, still in it. Like, yeah. The division. You know, you, know what's, you know what's crazy? That the fact that they're going to get – whoever wins it is rewarded with a home game. Like, I just think, like – I mean, I know right now maybe there's no fans, but that's – that should be – that shouldn't be allowed. Like, yeah, you make the playoffs fine, but they shouldn't be allowed to – you shouldn't be allowed to host a playoff game at 5-11. and 11. That's – like that, if they don't change the rule then, because I thought they should have changed it the year the Seahawks went seven and nine and beat the Saints. Like I, you know, like that's you under five hundred. How are you how are you rewarded with a home playoff game? You know what I'm saying? Like I understand all these things happen, but <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you, man. I mean, it's just well, look, you're three. The, the first place team is three six on one, and. Well, I mean, everybody has three wins, and they're still saying that they're all essentially tied for first and tied for last at the same time. You know, like, I, I've never seen that in my life. So, I, I, nobody deserves it. And, I mean, if I had to guess, I would probably say – honestly, I would probably say the Giants um, because they got the least amount of problems. I mean, you know, Cowboys, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, the Cowboys got the most weapons, but Philly is a mess. Washington, 
don't have a team name. So, I mean, it's just, you know, so I would probably guess the Giants just by default. I think I'll go with based off the schedules that everybody has. The Eagles pretty much have a tough schedule left. Uh, the Giants, um, I would put it between the Giants and the Cowboys, and I'm based off of what the Cowboys have left on their schedule. Some home games, some other teams that's below 500. I think the Cowboys probably going to squeeze in there, and that'll be a typical Cowboys type of thing to make it to the playoffs, get a home game. Jerry Jones talking crazy, like we have a chance to make noise, and then they lose in that big arena. I think this is this would this is literally a Cowboys type season. You're terrible. They make the playoffs. They get confidence and then lose. That that would be that would be a Cowboys season right there. That that would just be every year with them underachieving. They somehow get into the playoffs and don't do anything. Miles, somebody that you know you used to losing as of late. Who do you think is able to pull out this? Uh, I think the Cowboys, I think they, they they found their franchise quarterback in Andy Dalton, it looks like. So <laughs> now, now they're gonna ride the red the redhead into the playoffs. So I think they're gonna piggyback this win into some more wins. So it doesn't take that much to win this division at this point. I think six wins could get it done. Cowboys could get that in the next few weeks if they, you know, play like they did on Sunday. They played a little hungrier than they have all season, so we'll see. That'd be real twenty twenty. The Cowboys win the Super Bowl at six and ten. <laughs> I hope. I'll never, I'll never. I'll never watch football again. Oh. I promise you, if that happens, it's curtain. They got the Eagles, uh, Giants, Forty ers Bengals, and the Ravens on their schedule for the rest of the uh, rest of the year. Outside of the Ravens, everybody else is pretty much a. a Kind of a pick em game. 49ers are riddled with injuries. Joe Burrow just got injured for the rest of the year. Eagles, Carson Wentz. It's a lot of uh, nice. yeah, it's a lot of middle school quarterbacks I've seen that probably could have a better position. And then they finish off the season with the Giants. So I think just because of their schedule, they'll probably be able to get in. Um, we're gonna transition for this segment. Start bench cut. Out of the quarterbacks that are struggling this season, I want to know from each of y'all who are you going to start, who are you going to bench, and who are you going to cut? Sam Darnold, Daniel Jones, or Wentz, we just mentioned? Start bench cut. Yeah, and one of them is the quarterback. I'm going to start Darnold. I'm uh, I'm going to bench Wentz. And I'm cutting Daniel Jones. I don't believe Wentz is as bad as has been made. It he hasn't played well, but I think there's a lot of other things going on with him than than we know about. He, I don't know, but he he has a, a turnover problem. It's almost like Daniel Jones transferred that to Philly, like transferred that disease down the Garden State over to Philly because. <laughs> Carson Wentz is just throwing two picks a game. Like, that's – if you got a bet, take the over in that every week because he's going to throw at least two picks. I, I don't understand. Cause the, the excuse was that he didn't have weapons. Then some of those weapons come back and still the turnovers continue. That's why I don't have any more excuses for Wentz. But, yeah, I'm starting Darnold. That's my guy. Um. Yeah, so I would start Darnold. I think he's the most talented. Yeah. Um, if you know, you know, he's just on a terrible team. You know, the guy can't throw the ball if he's not getting blocked for. So I, w- I would start Darnold. I would bench Jones, um, and I would I would cut Wentz just because. Well, one, I know Wentz at one point was an MVP. Well, would have been the MVP if he didn't tear his ACL that year, trying to do some heroic touchdown dive. I don't know what he was trying to do against the Rams that one game. But I think ever since he got paid, I, I think he just doesn't even care or, you know, or his flaws is just showing more. Um, but, look, I, that's by default because Jones is not that greatest anyway. He has a turnover problem too, at least, like I said, at least two a game that you're at least good for. He has some he has some talent, obviously, but like I said, just by default, I, would, I guess I would have to go with Jones, uh, Benson, Wentz being, being cut. Uh, 
as crazy as that sounds, but I mean, once you have, no, I mean, the play he did against Cleveland, I don't know. He, he, he lobbed the ball for 20 yards in the air until they did that pick six. I don't know what he was. That was, that was a rookie move. But even then I don't, rookies don't do that, you know? So I don't know. I, I don't got faith in any of them, honestly, but, but it's just a case of the segment. Yeah. For the future, um, <laughs> For the future, the quarterback that I will go with going in the future, I'm doing the same thing as Jay. I got Darnold, and then I got Daniel Jones. And Wentz, I think he's just a shell of himself. Um, he got his bag. I think he's really towards now. He's towards being like that back quarterback from here on out. Um, that's the one. Yeah, they. that's where I see it going at this point. The way he's playing – and the fact of how terrible this division is, and they can only muster up three games, and they're supposedly supposed to be like the, the favorite this year going in. Yeah, Wentz got to get cut. Next one, the injured players that have the best comeback season. They're injured right now, and we're going to see who's able to – we're going to start bench cut who we think is going to come back best. Joe Burrow, who we know just had the MCL, ACL, and structural damage. Odell with the ACL. And Saquon Barkley with the ACL also. Star bench cut, who are you taking in the future as the best to bounce back from their injury? Um, I would, oh, man. Uh, I would probably, again, because he's a quarterback, I would start I would start Burrow just because, I mean, you've seen people come back from that injury, and that's the most important position. So I would I would start him because he, he, he has – all the talent in the world, and he just – that's the guy you obviously want to lead your team. And, and depending on how bad that structural damage is, like I said, I'm not really sure how bad it is, but with technology nowadays, I think he'll be fine. Um, I would probably bench OBJ if he was in the right situation because um, he's – look, he's – people forget. If he's arguably top three. You know, um, I know once he went to Cleveland, it's kind of – up, but I mean, again, you got Baker throwing you the ball, so I don't know. And they don't just, they don't, I don't know what they're doing over there. But the reason, and I know it might not be like, you know, one of those things. Saquon being cut sounds crazy, but he's a running back, and an ACL injury on a running back is terrible, especially for him. Like they were talking about in college, the way he does his jukes, you would have thought he tore it, up. he's gonna tear it every year. Like he's just, he puts so much pressure on his knees. So him tearing his ACL. Is not good at all. Um, and the running back is the most easy, the easiest position to replace. As as talented as he is, um, you know he he has to rely on so much more than a receiver and a quarterback. Um, I mean, you know, I just you know everything has to work out perfectly for a running back to be good. Um, you know, a quarterback can make things happen himself, or you know, depending on the situation. And then obviously, a receiver does his own thing. But yeah, I think that because of the positions, I think that's the way I would go: QB, receiver, and then. The running back. How you see it, Miles? I think I would go with like Saquon. I would start Saquon honestly because I I see him coming back and having a good season, having a good career. Because if you look at it, like yeah, ACLs are rough, but you look at Adrian Peterson when he tore his ACL, he came back and rushed for almost <laughs> broke the record, almost like he rushed for over two thousand yards that next season. So he's one of those type of running backs that are just different like we've already seen how special he is and I know he's going to attack the rehab and come back and he's basically their whole offense at this point because they traded Odell they got rid of other pieces I'm sure Evan Ingram's going to be on his way out too so he's got the keys in this offense I, I don't know if I necessarily trust Daniel Jones to be the guy but they're definitely going to put the ball in Saquon's hands more than not and then I would bench Joe Burrow just because like you said, quarterback is the most important position. They're going to build around him. They're probably going to lose a lot of games now, probably won't win another game, and they're going to have a high pick. So they're going to be able to build around him even more. And Odell, at this point, I have to cut him because I don't know if he's injury prone, but he's been getting hurt probably, I think, three of the last four years. He's He hasn't finished the season. So it, it could be because of where he's been, like – Cleveland is not one of the places I would want to be, but that's the position he's put himself in. And I don't know. He could be on the move again after this year, but it's not looking good. 
because he was on a trajectory that was one of the like elite starts to your career and now he's kind of tailed off none to his fault but like injuries happen he's got a terrible quarterback I don't know I don't I don't trust Odell as much as I used to only thing I would caution with Saquon you made a great point with Adrian Peterson but with Saquon is he gonna have people to block for him next year because that offensive line in New York both offensive lines from both teams, Jets and Giants, my grandmother could probably block better than some of them. So I don't know. Saquon, if I'm him, I'm a little concerned coming back to not – I'm not having nobody block for me. You saw that the first game of the season. He had, what, 19, 20 yards? And, you know, people was having conversations like, oh, did Saquon lose a step? He ain't had nobody to block for him. As somebody that pays attention to the MC East, Saquon – arguably was like the most explosive talent in that division. And anybody knew at any point, he might have 20 yards going into the fourth quarter, but he might break for a 50 yard run easily. So I think they got to shore up that offensive line for him. I feel like they will though. Cause one, they're going to have a new GM next year. I don't think Gettleman's going to come back cause he's God awful. Some of the things he's done terrible. So the, the next GM is going to come in and see the offense, knowing that you need blocking in this league. You can't have an offense without blocking. They're going to go after that, whether it's in the draft, probably a first-round pick, free agency. I mean, hopefully they, they pick better than Nate Solder, who's – he's terrible, and they're paying him but, but money. You, but, like, you know, they said that the last few years, the problem is you can say the draft and everything like that, but when's the last – some they drafted a good offensive lineman, and they're always they have been they've had top picks. You know, Eric Flowers and Andrew Thomas has been bust completely. So I think like, you know, if you're in Saquon, do you even have faith that they're gonna get somebody that that is good? You know, they got developed them. I mean, they keep swinging and missing. I think by the by the averages, they they have to swing and hit on one of these picks. But that's just another year wasted as a running back, and and again, they had the shortest shelf life. So. You know, obviously he can't really make any demands right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's if he's not there. But if he doesn't get a new contract with them, or they end up trying to trade him, just because you're just, you're wasting the man's career. You're gonna keep drafting all, all these offensive linemen that are not good. And like I said, they 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 were a good offensive linemen the last couple of years. They just picked the wrong guy. Mm-hmm. Next next question. Um, we saw we already talked about it. The Rams was able to pull out that win. Uh, Seattle able to beat the Cardinals. They they have three teams in that division that easily could make it to the playoffs that easily are in the conversation to be a Super Bowl contender. Who do you start bench cut in regards of winning that division? Seattle at seven and three, the Rams at seven and three, and the Cardinals at six and four. I'm going with personally. I'm gonna start the Rams. Yep. I'm a bench the Cardinals, and I'm cutting Seattle because that defense is abysmal, and you can't rely on Russell Wilson to save the day every day. This is not Kansas City. Like Kansas City's defense isn't per se the most elite, but you got Patrick Mahomes. Give him a minute left on the clock, I take my chances. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with the Rams. You know, I, I would start the Rams. That defense is really good, and I mean, Jared Goff just has to be good enough for them to make the playoffs and make a run. But I would I would bench the Seahawks. I still believe in Russell Wilson. I still think you got to give him the benefit of the doubt. Even though he hasn't looked as good, I still think that when it comes down to crunch time, that's the quarterback that I want out of this whole division, maybe even this whole league most of the time, besides Mahomes. I would want him – in my locker room and on my field playing for me because he just knows how to get it done and knows how to win. And this year it's been tough because that defense is <laughs> – I don't even know what to describe. You got to get the man that. some help. He's by himself. Yeah. That, defense tried. Needs, that defense needs some milk, bro. They, they tried. They tried with Jamal, Jamal Adams, but that didn't work out. Um, I thank the Seahawks every day that they made that trade because that was so dumb. That didn't help. Yeah, yeah. That didn't help them any bit. 
Like at all. It was a safety. They might have got worse. Yeah, they got worse because he's not like that type of safety. He's a box safety. He's not a cover safety. And we've seen that now. It's on display. He's in the worst defense in the league and you're on front street right now. And yeah, you want a team, yeah. yeah. So he was complaining about being on the Jets. Well, all right. Now you're on the worst defense in the league. So have fun. And, and it's on public display. I, I think definitely the Rams, uh, in my opinion, you start. They're just the most complete team. Um, you know, Jared Goff just doesn't – if he just game manages, they'll be fine. Um, their, their running game is okay, but the defense is definitely um, the best in the division. Um, and they have, obviously, weapons on the outside for receiving. Um, I would definitely say I would bench Arizona. Again, they're more complete than Seattle. You know, for – you know, you might, you might say Russell over Murray, that's fine. Um, but they got DeAndre – and I know Seattle has DK, but that's not the same. Um, you know, running backs, I would probably you know, give it to uh, – when they're healthy, I'll, I guess I would give it to Seattle, but then you just go back to the, the defense. And Arizona has a, a way better – an actual defense. Um, so, you know, I think that Seattle – Russell has to do too much to win the game. And if he doesn't do it, you see when he, he presses. Um, so – and they lose. And, you know, they turn, over, they turn the ball over and stuff like that. So – I would I would say that Seattle would be the odd man out just by the fact that they don't have a defense. Now we have Thanksgiving's tomorrow. We got some Thanksgiving games coming up. We're gonna go with those picks real quick. We already know Baltimore versus Pittsburgh is being postponed because of COVID. So it's only be two games tomorrow. Houston and Detroit. Detroit always is on Thanksgiving and Dallas is always on Thanksgiving. So Houston and Detroit, who do you see? win in that game? Who's your pick on that one? Houston. I mean, mm. it's Matt terrible Stafford, game. yeah. Matt Stafford's, like, banged up. Kenny Galladay's not even going to play. I don't think Swift is playing either. Yeah, he's got he's coming off a concussion. We don't know what, what that whole thing is. I just think Deshaun, he gets it done. He always finds a way to get it, even though they're pretty bad this year. He finds a way to make the games close at least and against the lions i don't know they're not that good to me so you don't believe in adrian peterson <laughs> is he, well, is he if, he if you asked me that 10 years ago it would be easy but or now, five yeah now <laughs> i don't i don't believe in him as much in the other game washington and dallas i'm picking dallas uh as I we do why. i wonder why yeah you know, can they just fast forward tomorrow? Because the games are just terrible. Um, yeah. Uh, I would say Houston is definitely better than Detroit, um, even though Houston's record is terrible. Like, they don't even keep their pick. So that's, I don't know, they, they, there's no point losing for them. They might as well try to win games. Um, but um, I would say, I guess I would say Dallas, but really can't underestimate Washington because that, they got three wins too, so you know it's a division game. It can go either way, but who's supposed to win that game is Dallas. But I'm gonna go with the other side. I'm gonna take Washington honestly because I got no faith in Dalton or Jerry Jones for that matter. I think yeah. it's safe to say. I think it's safe to say we won't be locked in on any, either of these games. I was looking forward to that Baltimore Pittsburgh game, but these two games, yeah, th- this is not gonna be the year to sit a, sit at the TV and eat. And why not these games? You might turn on a movie or something like and check. Oh, I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch that uh, Fresh Prince reunion. To be honest with you, I'm not, I'm doing anything else but watching those games. Our last couple of star bench cut is Thanksgiving season. Thanksgiving is tomorrow, so we're gonna have a little fun with Thanksgiving food, which is one of the biggest things outside of, of course, the list of things that we can be thankful for. Thanksgiving meats, star bench cut, turkey. Honey baked ham, fried chicken. I'm going to go. Turkey is trash. It's trash. You have to then deal with the leftovers for two, three weeks, trying to figure out what to do with it. It get dry. I'm going to go start honey baked ham, bench fried chicken, and we're going to demolish, not even cut, we're demolishing turkey. Like, put that in a, a, a fire somewhere. That's how I'm going with it. What's y'all take on it? 
I'm I'm going the same way. I don't even have to say anything. I I hate turkey. I don't even look at it on Thanksgiving. So I was gonna replace it with stuffing if I could. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's not meat. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not meat. There's meat in there a little bit, but yes, I guess. <laughs> um, well, look by default, I have to I have to cut honey baked ham because I don't eat pork. But I will say. Um, between the two, look, I'm not the biggest fan of turkey where I'm like, I'm, I'm craving it or anything like that. But it's, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I, well, look, we, we deep fry turkey. So I don't know if that makes it better or not, but that definitely helps. Um, so I would definitely put that one. Look, I love fried chicken, trust me, but I can have that any day of the week. And it's, that's just like a regular thing. So that I would, that I would cut fried chicken. Um, but look, I'll, I'll, if I could, I'll eat both of it if it's possible. But, Yo, um, so that means we got to pull up to your spot for a plate because deep fried turkey, now nah, yo, let me tell you something. That's a whole nother conversation from that's turkey. I'm Once you deep fry turkey, you don't go back to the regular stuff. That, yeah. that's, exactly. You got to find the right people to deep fry it because I've had it before, but everybody don't do that. Deep fried turkey. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. It, it definitely is dangerous to cook and it's dangerous in your mouth. That junk slam your mouth. I'm telling you. Mm. Deep fried turkey, it make deep fried turkey is the Chiefs. Turkey is the Cowboys. Put it that way. Exactly. Or the Jets. I was trying to I was trying to spare spare the films on that one. No, oh, no, we yeah. can't do there's no sparing. <laughs> I'm happy to log off on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, Thanksgiving dessert. Mm. Pumpkin pie, sweet potato pie, banana pudding. Mm. I was mm. so me personally. I mean, if it's a season, I would go pumpkin pie. But I love banana pudding, man. I'll, I'll start banana pudding. I would, I would bench uh, pumpkin pie, and and the last one was actually, I don't like sweet potato pie, so that's, that's out. That's gone. Cutting sweet potato. That's out. Miles, I'm starting pumpkin pie. Uh, I'm benching sweet potato, and then I'm cutting banana pudding. Um, what? I've never been the biggest fan of that. That's terrible, man. Yo, how you like your banana pudding? I Ooh. don't. I don't like it. That's the I'm point. not asking you. I'm not asking you. <laughs> yeah, we know you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> look, man, I mean, look, I'm not really picking when it comes to banana pudding, but when I when I do have it, you know, we got the, the wafers, um, you know, uh, unlimited amount of those, and, and just obviously, like, you know, the, the, the banana cream is just, mm, I, I mean – like I don't really know what how when they make it how they do it. I just know when it's on the plate. It's not on my plate for long. Starting <laughs> sweet potato pie. Um, benching banana pudding. And pumpkin pie got a it got a go, bro. I I'm pumpkin pie. Heck, no sweet potato pie every single day of the week. Look, I'll say this: If it was pumpkin cheesecake, then I was starting that all day. Oh, see that now we now we talking about something different, just like the turkey conversation. I'll have yeah. pumpkin cheesecake. That that's elite right there. That's next level. Right there. Bringing fancy desserts to the to the table. Sweet potato cheesecake. Yeah, do it. Yeah, do it right. <laughs> well, this has been another fun episode of the Bench Mob Podcast. We thank y'all for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share this. It's Thanksgiving time. Make sure you watch this with your family. Share it with your cousin, your baby mom. Even if you don't like us, share it with everybody. Um, y'all know the vibes. Stay ready. You ain't got to get ready. Enjoy y'all Thanksgiving. Stay safe out there. Peace. Peace.